today we are going to be talking about Gerhard Richter. And um, Richter just had a show that none of us got to see at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Unless you were a lucky one who went back in February when it first opened. Um, the name of the show was Painting After All. And, you know, one of the things I'll say about him is the one thing I can say for sure about him is he's a guy who loved to paint. He just loves painting. And, you know, he's approached it from a lot of different directions. Um, he's really a skilled painter, but a very challenging artist. Um, as you see, you know, these two self-portraits, they're kind of blurry. Um, and this is a technique that he's employed uh, throughout his career. It really is kind of um, to not get hung up in details, not get hung up in, in the, the, the nuance of, of expression and all of that. But also, there's this business of doubt, the business of questioning everything. This is, this is, in a way, something which is thematic throughout all of his work. Um, he works in very diverse um, um, approaches. So what I'm going to do is switch on to the next Okay. Throughout his career, he, he has worked back and forth between abstraction and representation, between these photo-derived paintings and, and very abstract, process-oriented paintings. Um, it, it, for, for him, you know, um, this photo-derived realism is um, in a way, exploring the, the questioning of a photograph as a document of what is real. You know, he uses the photograph to paint from, but, but he's also doing more with it. He's editing these photographs. He's playing around with them. And, and, he does extensive photography of his own, but he'll use he'll use um, clippings from newspapers. He'll use um, advertisements. He'll he'll just use anything that 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 comes along. He'll work from dictionaries. He'll he'll use anything as as material to work from for these. Where the abstract paintings are really about the material. It's about putting the paint on and taking it off. It's, it's a process that he goes through with these. Um, and in some ways, the question of what is more real, the, the painting that he does derived from a photograph or the painting that he does by applying paint to a surface, that real experience of applying paint to a surface is something that he is really interested in. And he gets these really luscious surfaces. They're beautiful paintings that come out of that process. Um, so what I'll do at this point is Larry, go on. Yeah. How big are these paintings, um, well, especially that abstract? Are the abstracts very are very large. They are um, up to, you know, they can be as large as as 25 feet by by 15 feet this one in particular is is somewhere around eight by eight feet okay and i'll talk a lot more about how he gets the paint on there he actually he actually does gestural painting underneath the surface with a paintbrush and then uses a squeegee a large squeegee that he's that he's created to rake the paint across and tear it back down off of the surface. And so it's a very laborious process that he goes through with these. So let's see, we're gonna go on. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit 
a little bit about his history. He was born in 1932 um, and basically uh, was born under Nazism. Um, uh, his um, experience in that was, you know, he was, he was a young child, so what did he know? Um, um, his, his, um, basically his family, you know, his father was a, was a, uh, a teacher and, and was of course forced to become part of the Nazi party in order to continue to teach, um, was never actually, I'll retract that. He, he joined the National Socialist Party, but he was never a Nazi. Let's put it that way. Um, his, basically, Richter's experience during that time, um, his um, aunt, Marianne, was um, uh, a very um, cultured person who brought him to exhibits and things like that. She, she brought him as a young boy to see the, the degenerate art exhibition that had been put together by the, by the Nazis to ridicule contemporary art. And they went to see it as an art exhibit that would expose him to what was really cutting edge and, and extremely beautiful if if expressive art um so if any of you are familiar with that degenerate art show it it had all of the german expressionist painters and abstract painters in it and they they derided these people but when if you went to it and you just looked at the art you would be taking in the artwork and that affected him profoundly and she was certainly open to it. Um, so what happened out of that? Let's see, I'm gonna go on to the next, uh, not that, that one. Um, what happened out of that was um, basically uh, the, the, war, the war came, his, his aunt Marianne developed, we think schizophrenia, uh, in her late teenage, early 20s, and ended up in an asylum under the Nazis that was not such a good place to be, and was ended up being starved to death in, a, in an asylum. Um, his uncle Rudy, who we see on the right, was in, in the German army. Um, none of them were, were uh, card carrying Nazis, but he died in the war nonetheless, and, and his other uncle also died. Um, his father, toward the end of the war, was recruited in, into, um, into the Eastern Front and was, was um, captured and prisoner of war, but returned to them after the war. Um, so what we're, what we're seeing here are two of the photographs that 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 Richter worked from after the war. I'm going to go back now to this um, other piece that I was looking at. This was something that Richter worked on. It's a mural that he did in East Germany. So what happened was he went to the academy in in um, in East Germany under the, the, uh, the German Democratic Republic, which we know was anything less than, uh, it was a less than desirable place to be. Um, it, it really was, again, you know, he grew up under two totalitarian regimes. And, and his experience of that was, you know, carrying the party line, because that's what you did in order to paint. But he, went to West Germany and saw some of the things that were going on in the U.S. 
through some of the exhibits that were there. He saw Jackson Pollock and some of the abstract painters. And soon after that, just before the, the, um, the wall went up between East and West Germany, he and his wife escaped to, to West Germany. And he um, began to explore, okay, what was going on in the West. And he, he went, to, went to school um, again to, you know, by this time he was, he was close to 30 years old. Um, he had developed as a, as a painter, but exploring a lot of what was going on in the West, he led him to a lot of different kinds of, of imagery. And, you know, this, this painting on the top of the table with the smear over it is kind of his um, uh, dissolving of, of the image of stepping away from having to represent anything. Um, it's, it's a still life with no still life. Um, and, and, and then below, you see the toilet paper, this close-up toilet paper, this beautifully rendered black and white image of a roll of toilet paper. Humble, humble subject. Um, you know, Unlike, unlike America, where, where you have Andy Warhol doing a wall full of, of Campbell's soup cans, we have this single toilet paper roll. Um, you could say that that had something to do with his experience in, in the deprivation of East Germany, but that's something else. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, the, the handprints the hands, the, the, the expressive tool of the artist. Um, it, you know, all of this stuff, you know, kind of fuzzy, kind of blurry, kind of, you know, it's there and it's not there. Um, okay, let's see, we're gonna move on. Now, now this is, this is when he kind of started to reach into, um, exploring his family that he had left behind, really. Um, he, for the first year or two, he was just opening himself up to all kinds of different influences from pop and from abstract painting in, in the U.S. What, what these are is a crystallization of something that he really had some kind of resonance with. Again, did not want to get hung up in, in detail. It, it, they, they are not, I call them photo derived paintings rather than photo realist paintings. In the United States, there were a lot of artists who were approaching photo realism. They were painting very sharp focus images. And, and these are really, you know, derived. They, they have this blurry effect. It's about memory. It's about, a resonant image. Um, the the whole idea of him exploring the Nazi devastation was something that not a lot of other artists were opening themselves up to in the 50s and 60s in Germany. So this is a theme which repeats itself throughout his career. This is something that's underneath the surface in a lot of his work. It's pop imagery. It's stuff that he's taking from everyday objects, but but it really is something that's that's unique in his work. Larry, okay. when yeah. were these painted? Uh, those At what year? The earlier ones were sixty-two and sixty-three. Okay, here we are in sixty-four. And you see the difference between Rosenquist and his pop crisp image with the with the the gaudy U.S. Air Force uh, image behind it, and this kind of blurry interceptor that Richter painted, and and there's there's a 
kind of straightforward icon in Richter, um, this ghost jet. It's, it's a bit more ominous than the, the joyful colors of Rosenquist and the juxtapositions of these images. Um, and here, again, this is, this is Andy Warhol with this electric chair with the contradictory colors, these bright, beautiful, like, you know, garish kind of um, almost psychedelic colors depicting this this kind of ominous scene with an electric chair where Richter is is kind of distancing himself from from this image now he viewed from afar the the destruction of Dresden so he saw the aerial bombings that took place and the destruction that took place there so on the one hand, this, this, there's a distancing, there's a separation, but there's also this, this sense of, of autobiography in it somehow. And again, you know, these are from 1970 and, and 71 or so. Um, he did these cityscapes and they're, they're, they're abstract paintings, they're representational, they are these kind of aerial views. There's an integration of the kind of abstract gestural marking in them. Um, and, and there's this townscape business, but there's also, you know, the one on the, on the right is, is an aerial view from Paris. And, and one of the things I heard in, in, in an interview with him was saying, you know, it was a little like, you know, Paris was not touched. Dresden was, was uh, rubble. I kind of took it out on Paris. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, the, these aerial views were of intact cities, but they looked like rubble. They looked like they'd been, you know, just decimated. Uh, this is what he grew up in you know, these bombed out cities. Um, so, again, we're back to him looking over his shoulder at what was going on in the U.S., you know. Um, this, this series from 72-73 was uh, some, an installation that he did for the Venice Biennial. And, and basically, it was a, a set of 48 portraits of authors and writers and um, musicians, um, philosophers. You know, if you look through here, you can, you know, find somewhere Einstein's mixed in there. There's, there's Kafka up in the upper, upper middle. You know, so there's, there's a lot of people in there that, that are recognizable characters all done in this kind of deadpan sameness. They're kind of, you know, they're these, they're these great minds that are reduced to a kind of same, simple, straightforward, deadpan shot. You know, where Andy Warhol's taking this, this icon and repeating it over and over again. Um, so it kind of, takes out the, the, the sorrow, the expressive image, the juxtaposition of the, of the funeral and the joy. That there's a whole thing going on there with the banality of the repetition. Um, there's also this business of the grid, which we're going to get into a bit more right now <laughs> where a whole other a whole other aspect of what was going on in the US had to do with minimalism had to do with with um, paring down abstraction taking out the gesture you know where the gestural abstraction was really kind of a and I'll talk more about this the gestural abstraction was really kind of a uh, 
a romantic notion about the expressiveness of the self in the mark that's on the canvas, okay? How when de Kooning used those big splashy marks on, on that canvas, it was an expression of, expression of his soul, where the drips of Pollock are, are this dance that comes out of the rhythm of his breathing, of how he moved, of how he danced across the surface. Where in the, in the 60s and 70s, American artists were questioning all of that. They were doing these conceptual things. Saul LeWitt wrote his paintings. He, on, the, on, the, on the left, you see a painting where what he would do is write how many layers of what color were going in what patch. Okay, you know, six layers of, of, of a thinned out magenta would go on the bottom one. And then a cyan of three would go in the next patch. And then a magenta, one layer of magenta with three layers of yellow would go in the next one. And he would write all this down and have other people paint them. He would have his students or he would have assistants paint the paintings. On the, on the right, is is Richter's response to that. He went into a paint store and he looked at a paint chart and said, oh, this is beautiful. I'm gonna paint this. So he would enlarge this piece to being, you know, again, eight by eight feet and he would match up the colors and he would paint them himself. He would paint them in these solid flat colors. And that was his process. Now, Another little note, and again, back to the underlying double meanings of a lot of Richter's work, is 180 Farben. Well, Farben was a German company that worked with the Nazis during, during, the, during Auschwitz. Farben used slave labor in their, in, their, in their camps, so they were very, this is a very methodical process. And, you know, this is something which, you know, there's a double edge to a lot of, of, of his work. There's an ironic sense of humor that goes along with these things that, that's played out. Okay, I'm gonna move on to the next. Another, you know, another thing, oh, I'll go back again. Stay with this for a second, which is, there's also this business of the found objects, okay? That had been played out since the, the early 20th century where that was part of a movement, um, the found object. And John Cage played this out in the 50s and 60s with his music that was just sound, that was found out on the street or that was incidental or accidental. So choosing this this paint chart was sort of yeah okay this is valid i'll do this um okay now we're going to move on um these were painted in the in the 70s um again this is this is a a, a political piece where um a group of revolutionaries called the bat batter mannheim manhoff uh, group were kind of these revolutionaries that were that were arrested and they died in prison under under mysterious circumstances couldn't tell whether they committed suicide or they were murdered in prison um, and and so he did this whole group of pieces off of that um, you know the ambiguity of you know, what side was he on? He was not choosing a side. He's just reporting what was going on there. But there's, a, there's an ambiguity to it that he really loved. And that's what he played with, you know. All right. So our history also plays into this thing where 
on your on your right, you're seeing Caspar David Friedrich, who was an 18th century romantic painter. Um, his his work will epitomize the romantic notion of the presence of of God in nature, of this this every everything in nature having a a a life and that we are humble before the face of it um where richter having come up through uh nazism totalitarian communism was was averse to any ism so romanticism was totally out of the out of the question so what he did was approach the beauty of nature the awesomeness of nature without that belief in 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 the creator behind it it really is um i'm going to move on to the next okay so on the on the left is a friedrich and in there, there are some little figures in, in this, and there's a, there's a, um, a ship that's wrecked on the, kind of on the right side of the, the glacier. Um, and it's really about the, the kind of um, immensity of, of the forces of nature. Richter on the right is dealing with the immensity of forces of nature in this iceberg, and yet it is a a sense of of cold indifference from nature of the ecological implications of this iceberg are something which at that time, I don't know that it was conscious, but it was there. It was part of what was going on unconsciously in Richter choosing this image. So back to the, the play between his family portraits and the intimacy of, of these pieces. And, and his abstract work. And, and he's playing back and forth throughout his career with doing these very sharp focused realist pieces and the abstraction. And it, it really has to do with his um, wanting to stay open, wanting to keep fresh. And, and, and also the the narrative that's kind of implicit in this piece the vulnerability of that position of how of of what he played with in the shot of his daughter um these are most of his most of his portraits of people and use of people unless it's a clipping or or some historical event are family um so here is his third wife and their and their child and you know this is kind of like playing off of the madonna and child business the the um the notion of that kind of maternal softness in that in that beautifully rendered piece you know he painted these things very crisply and clearly, as you can see in some of those other portraits that I've shown you, but then he'll take a soft brush and blur them out to make them have less specificity and make them have a more universal presence. You know, and then on the, on the right, he's taken the squeegee and just kind of erased the Madonna. And that whole notion of the Madonna and child is like, what's going on here? It's a more abstract notion. Okay, so we go on to again. You know, these are these are happening simultaneously. You know, this this beautiful portrait of of his his wife reading um, an art periodical or something, 
and her absorption in all of that. And this goes, you know, this harkens back to last week and dealing with Vermeer and all those letter writers and letter readers. And then, you know, at the same time, he's dealing with this, you know, vigorous painting, this really beautiful surface, these processes of putting paint on and taking it off. It's, it's really kind of very risky business, you know, where the, 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 the language he's using to represent the figure is very methodical and very slow and very plotted out. The abstract painting is very risk, risk involved. You know, he doesn't know what's going to happen when he puts on the next layer. He may totally destroy the painting in the process. And, and he doesn't know what that, what, how that's going to turn out. Okay. When I saw these, I was scratching my head. I was saying, what in the hell is going on here? He has this, this, this series of pieces that he did, which are mirrors and which are panes of glass. And at first, I was like, I don't get it. It took me a while to understand that it's about these reflections. It's about these transient images. It's about the, 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 the ghost-like reflections that are happening as we move around this thing and what that's all about and the questioning of what we're seeing. And that's essential in, in Richter's work. It's about doubt. It's about questioning what we see and what's real and what's not. Um, you know, and there's also the fragility, you know, the house of cards, it could fall at any moment and shatter into a million pieces. That's also part of that business of risk. And here he is. The man himself putting on some paint, and there is I I have a um uh again a reference page at the end of all this. There there is a uh, wonderful movie of him painting these paintings. Um, that was that was from I believe it was uh, the early two thousands or or. 2014 it might have been 2014 um and it's a really wonderful film it's available on canopy so it's free definitely worth watching um there's interviews with him in it but there's also him in the process of painting his paintings uh, and by the way is. just so people know canopy is a, a service that the library subscribes right. to if you yeah. go on our website and go to eMedia, you will be able to um, see where it says Canopy and you can click on it. Okay. Um, um, somebody, Roberta, sent us a website um, about, which is um, about the gallery, about the House of, House of Cards, which is just what we just saw. Okay. Okay. Um, right. We'll see if we can get that out. Okay, thank okay. you, Roberta. Okay, so on, on the right, you see the scale of some of Richter's work. So this is, this is a, um, two large scale pieces that were in process. And you know, this gives you some idea of how, how large some of these pieces can be while he's, while he's working on it. He now has two assistants that help him out. And you see on the left, these, very traditional, you know, subject matters that continue to be in there. And, you know, people are exasperated. They try and pin him down to anything and he's not having it. Um, you know, basically he'll, he'll, he loves to paint and he'll paint what he wants. Thank you very much. <laughs> so we're going to move on. Okay. So this is a series that he did, um, from uh, a, a woodlands abstraction and and 
left some remnants of those trees and the bark and the sense of, of, of being in, the, in that dark forest. Um, okay. These were painted in 2014. And on the left, you can see the photographs that these pieces were derived from. They were actually um, from photographs that were taken by an SS commando of, of the uh, Nazi prison camp and the, um, and the paintings on, on the left, on the right, were from his responses to that. There's a whole series of these that were in the show at, at, uh, at the Breuer that we won't get to see, unfortunately. Um, powerful, profound pieces. You know, some of them had some of those abstracted elements underneath the surface of the paint, but you know, this is, this is something which Richter has, has continued to bring up as a concern. Uh, Larry, we're yeah. not seeing the images. Something happened onto my computer too. Really? Can you enlarge the pictures? I don't know what happened. Um, I'm just getting me or you. Okay. Um, Are you seeing can, it now? I see it, but not big. You, really? you better share the screen again, see what happened. Okay. Okay, okay now go back into. Um, yeah, I'm going to. Okay, everybody, stay with us. Okay, are you seeing this? Yeah. Now? You yes. are. Okay. I'm not seeing you though. I'm down there. I can see you. I don't see you. Okay. How about now? You're not no. seeing me. No. Okay. You know well, what? I'll take me off the screen altogether. Okay. Oh, I just get the library screen. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. So can can people see this now? You can see this. Full screen? Yeah. Yes. All right. So I will actually go over and um, do a zoom in over here so you can see these pictures, which are remarkable pictures. And then he moves on. Okay. Back to these joyful, buoyant pieces. And, you know, that's, that's kind of, this is him in process with one of the really large scale pieces. And you can see the size of the squeegee that he's using across this surface to actually get that mark in there. Let me just start again. There's somebody who can see anything. Um, maybe you should go out of the whole program and then come back in. Yeah, that's what they're going to have to do. Yeah. Go ahead, Larry. Yep. Okay. So this is this process that he goes through where he's adding things in and, and taking them away. Underneath this, there's a there, he does these large, very large, loose gestural paintings where he'll take a huge house painting brush and paint on whole areas. And then, and then he'll come back in with a squeegee loaded with paint and drag it across the surface. And then, and then let that set up and then drag it back across, sometimes going in different directions, most of the time going in the same direction. I think some people are having trouble in, I, I don't know what kind of device they're on, <clears throat> enlarging the pictures. Okay. Um, I don't know what to tell you. And now pe some people see it fine, no problem. Okay, all right. Okay, so this is, this is, again, 
back to that business of, of um, him playing around with, uh, with Friedrich and that tradition of landscape painting. He's constantly coming back to the landscape. It's something which he, he really loves and enjoys painting. It's, it holds the fascination for him. And again, it's this, this blurring out the abstraction of, of the painting, the question of what are we seeing here? Is it a photograph? Is it a painting? What's going on? Okay, on the left, you can see there's basically the, the uh, full length documentary was uh, 2011 when that, when that happened. Um, there's also a number of YouTube lectures and you can go to the Met Museum and, and they have from this past exhibit, they have a whole series of half hour talks by artists responding to um, Richter's work. And they have also interviews with Richter on there. So there's a lot of information out there on Richter. There is also a really wonderful film called Never Look Away. And that film is about his early career. It, it basically covers from his childhood up into his coming to um, West Germany and starting to paint his more mature paintings. And there's a lot of stuff in there that has to do with his father-in-law having been a gynecologist and worked under the Nazis. And there's some implication that he might have been involved in the extermination camps and might even have been involved in his, uh, Richter's uh, aunt Marianne's um, uh, liquidation. We don't know that for sure. That's all up, up for grabs. As I said in the beginning, doubt is all part of Richter's work. <laughs> so I'm going to leave you with that note, and we'll move on to next week. Um, okay. Next, uh, unless there's questions. If anybody has any questions, I'd be I'm, more than happy to answer them. I'm not getting anyone, um, but I don't see you on the screen. Well, I see um, you. Okay. Um, some people are giving us um, websites to go to on IMDB. IMDB has the uh, Never Look Away. Okay. okay. Um, you can also get it for free for a one week. You know, if you sign on through uh, Amazon Prime to Stars, they give you a one week trial. And Stars is carrying Never Look Away. It's a long movie. It's three three hours and nine minutes nine long. Minutes. So you might want to look at it in a few sittings. Um, true. But that's a way to get to see it without without paying, you know, the fee. Right. Okay. So Larry, just give us a little synopsis about next week. Okay. So next week we're going to be doing Jake Lawrence. And there is an exhibit that's taking place at. Um, uh, the Met, which is opening supposedly next week. Um, and it's called The American Struggle. And it features a series, a, a series of little scene um, paintings of, uh, from the history of the American people that he painted in 1954 to 1956. So if you don't know Jacob Lawrence's work, he is an American, a black American modernist. Um, and he um, basically painted a, a, a whole series of historical paintings at various points in his career, um, which we'll explore next week in more depth. Okay. Um, I just want to comment. Some of the people, these are um, questions about People cannot see the comments that participants are making. We've done that specifically because we're always worried about Zoom bombing. If you haven't heard about it, it's when people um, go on and uh, make comments to the entire group that could be uh, comments we'd rather not see or hear. 
So the library has decided that only the, that only I see the comments and I read them to Larry. So I'm sorry that you can't all see them, but that's the way we've decided to go. Um, uh, so that's that's all. But Larry, thank you very much. And okay. I hope you all come to next week at two o'clock and to all the other art programs that I mentioned in the beginning. And if you have any questions, visit our website at chappaqualibrary.org. Okay, I thank you all. Was, a, was an amazing author, um, artist. I'd never even heard of him. And yeah, amazing paintings, that's for sure. He's something. <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you all for coming, and I hope to see you next week. And Larry, if you wouldn't mind staying on. Sure. I'll wait until we get down to the two of us. Right. There's a question. How do you decide on what artists to present? Okay. Um, what, what I've been doing is mostly focusing on people who have been having exhibits that we haven't gotten to see. Um, with, with Vermeer, uh, the Frick is actually closed and is reopening they are doing um, renovation on the Frick. So that's one of the reasons why I chose Vermeer because they're going to be reopening in a temporary lodging at the, um, at the Breuer. Um, the Metropolitan Museum has moved out of there and, and the Frick is gonna temporarily be housed in that, in that facility. So that's mainly how I've been picking people to work with. But I'm also trying to pick some kind of continuity right. between them. So right. the, the photography business and the relationship between Richter's photography, photographically oriented stuff and, and, and Vermeer and the, the love of the material. That was one of the things that I wanted to play around with and, and, and look at in the two of them. Okay, thank you again for all, um, lots of compliments again. So uh, thank you all for coming.